and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis, and welcome to the show. And I am in Connecticut with our guest today, Mark D'Antonio. We have Alejandro Rojas coming up live in just a second. But just before that, a couple of things. Uh, you know, when you make a mistake or two, uh, I actually made two mistakes last week, and uh, I got many, many emails, and I want to apologize. <laughs> it's crazy. I said, Happy Veterans Day. Well, this is the real Veterans Day. It came up on my computer. I looked down at my computer just before we went live, and I saw Veterans Day, but obviously it was on the 11th, and I apologize to that. Um, so, veterans, you get two Veterans Day uh, celebrations this, this uh, year because of me. And Anyway, I apologize for that. And the second thing is I said uh, Australia had 2 million people. Well, that was a verbal typo. I meant to say 23 or 20 million. It is actually 23 million, and I got uh, almost that many emails from you down under, and uh, we have a lot of listeners there, and thank you for your comments. I always welcome your comments. Well, we only have one more week for our T-shirt graphic contest, and let me tell you, the votes, the voting uh, application on it is, is kind of screwy. You can't really see the results. I can see the results, but we need more people voting on that. We have uh, just one week left, and you can choose that. Go right on podcastufo.com, and you can see um, T-shirts right on the sidebar. Click on that, and you can vote, and we... Um, Also, uh, you can support the show to listen to the second half. You can listen to the whole show live every week right here in the Dark Matter Digital Network. And I think that is it. We're just about ready to go here. Alejandro, how are you? Thanks for joining us live. I'm all right. I'm a little frustrated. Uh Uh-oh, what happened? Frustrated. So I post this video today. You know, uh, we've talked about these sightings. There was this one in Texas, and I got a lot of heat, maybe you did too, for telling people it was a light. It was a street lamp, a highway street lamp. And we've seen these since where they're circular lights or two lights, and people are taking a picture from the road, and uh, they get these, these lights that they didn't see themselves but show up in the camera and those and they're shaped exactly like the lamps uh, on the streets so i took a video of this happening while i'm driving so you could see how it's just a reflection moving around from the street lights and i posted it for reference so people can see and people are just flipping out that's not a ufo that's obviously a reflection and it's like <laughs> oh my gosh exactly it's a reflection that's my point so I, that's got me all <laughs> flustered. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm sure you notice this, but, you know, we, we have a pretty active Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And um, people uh, tend to look at the picture and react. Yeah. And that's it. They don't um, – it's very, very few click-throughs to an actual story. I, I've noticed that. You have to yeah. keep things as simple as possible. Right. If you can put I have a whole a little... story in, an, in a title, you're doing – that's the only way people can actually see it. You're right. I have a little saying that I'll post, and I love doing it. And I'll put, click the link, read the story, and all shall be revealed. And when I type it, that's how I'm thinking of it. Click the link and read the story, and all shall be revealed. So I post that when people are like, oh, dude, that's probably a bird. Well, if you read the story, it would explain how it is a bird. Or... And, and Alejandro, I have to tell you, this is Mark. Um, Mark. Uh, I apologize to you again on the air. I've done that to you. <laughs> oh, that's true. Mark has totally done that. I have had to use that little saying of mine on Mark, and he's probably the most, the highest ranking researcher I've ever had to use that. Uh, but, you know, we all get busy. But, but you only uh, had to use it once. That's true. And you did apologize, and uh, you, you just like Martin did earlier. <laughs> yes. Because there's two million people in Australia thing. 
Yeah, that's right. So um, what else is happening for news this week? It seems like there's some things going on. Yeah, UFO news. I've got a few stories here. Of course, there's the Navy missile test that I'm sure you and Mark are going to talk a lot about. And uh, you know what's great about this picture, and some people have noticed it, but I'm sure this frustrates Mark as well. You know, you see this cone of, of gases, and you see a little purple streak in the middle. And we've seen this before, uh, and those have been missile tests in the past. Uh, what's frustrating is most of the people who are posting these pictures and saying, look, it looks just like the, the spiral in Norway, or it looks just like this. They're posting those as arguments that it's not a missile um, when, uh, you know, I, in fact, Mark came on my show, and at the beginning of the show when it came to the Norway spiral, I was like, Come on, Mark, how can this be a missile? And he explained it to me, and by the end of the show, I was like, okay, it's a missile. But um, that's what these are. You know, we even have similar pictures uh, taken by the military where uh, where they're showing, you know, different missile tests. So um, it's spectacular. I think the video, at least the video we posted that Chloe... Chloe uh, Kardashian actually also tweeted of this missile test is spectacular. I mean, the video is amazing. This this gaseous cloud took up so much of the sky. Um, I think less of it. It's not a UFO. It's a missile. What I think is scary is uh, the state of affairs with our our Russian friends, your Russian friends that you just went and visited, the old lady who wanted to kill you. Um <laughs> I, the, what's scary is that we're, we're testing these missiles uh, when we have kind of this uh, Cold War kind of reigniting. Right. No, I. It was. Uh, I watched those uh, the videos and I thought it was. Uh, I, I knew right away after seeing some uh, missile mm-hmm. shots before that it was very similar, and uh, so it had to be most likely that. But um, it was pretty amazing where people were absolutely flipping out because they didn't know what it was, and it, they were scared. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I can see why people – I mean, it is such a weird thing. But what really yeah. puzzles me is that, you know, they – I guess they have to keep it secret when they're going to launch it. But it's too bad they didn't let the public know or at least Yeah, they it- can't give away – yeah. Daylight or something, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and that's why people are going to get scared. They don't know what it is. But uh, it is surprising. And I'm sure you and Mark will talk about this. How many people still don't believe it is a missile? In fact, I, I titled my story, Naval Missiles Test Causes UFO Scare. I've got two comments on that story. It's a lot of reads, but two comments. Both of these people are saying, oh, that's not a missile. And they are explaining themselves with it. their theories don't make sense to me. But, um, yeah, uh, still a lot of people who think this is some kind of cover-up or, or something going on there. Yes, I heard the word cover-up, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of people call it a cover-up. Yeah. So what else do we have going on? What else? We got a cool story from Roger Marsh, uh, the MUFON's director of uh, communications. Of course, he posts stories at openminds.tv. And this is one of a commercial pilot. And it's an interesting story of a commercial pilot who says, uh, you know, they saw a bright light in the sky above them to the left, and it turned into two rectangular-shaped lights. So uh, kind of an interesting story. It's a bit short, and there's a drawing, a sketch from the pilots. There's no picture or video, but uh, it's always exciting to get a sighting report from commercial pilots. Excellent. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I know. It's it's kind of rare, very rare that that happens. Um, So is that it for this evening? No. Okay, good. Let's keep going, buddy. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So the next one, the last one. I think this one's really cool. Actually, I saw this story uh, It was posted in a Canadian paper a few weeks ago, and uh, it was kind of their Halloween story. But uh, what's cool about this is this is a story actually from 1978 of a UFO sighting in Clarenville, uh, which is a town in Newfoundland in uh, Canada. And this police officer, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police, but... Um, 
He saw he was called to the site of a UFO sighting in 1978. He only recently posted this YouTube video of an interview from back then, and I think that's what's cool about this. Hmm. And uh, he did this interview with a Canadian newspaper where he talks about it. But he was called to the scene. There's about a dozen people there. And he says only maybe about 100 feet away from the shore in between him and uh, a island called Random Island, that there's this craft floating above the water. Um, he says it's off the, you know, the water. It's floating, hovering there. He said it was the size of a Boeing 737, and it was cigar-shaped. Uh, he looked at it with some very popular or very powerful telescope uh, that they used for, I guess, uh, looking for planes carrying drugs and stuff back then. And um, he said this thing was just weird. He said that the cover of it was kind of uh, jagged. It wasn't soft. It was a bit coarse. Uh, but they watched it for like two hours before it took off very quickly in the sky. Um, so nobody knows what this was. Uh, the media got a hold of it, and this is kind of an interesting part of this story also. He shied away. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want the other cops to make fun of him. But his superiors told him to do every interview that uh, request that he gets, and wow. he got a ton. He got them from CNN and from uh, all of the news agencies wanted to interview him, and he did the interviews, uh, but he said it kind of made his life hell because he – uh, he was known for the UFO thing, and Clarenville no, became uh, famous for this UFO sighting. Uh, eventually, he left, and he went to no Nova Scotia, where he lives now, and he never talked about the UFO thing again. He recently was in an episode, or will be, of, of a show called Close Encounters. Uh, I think Mark might be in that show, but uh, it's, I think it's only aired in Canada but it sounds like a really good show. I know there's a lot of UFO researchers who have been in it, but they're going to cover this case in an upcoming episode. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that show is really good, but I don't think it's mm-hmm. come to the United States yet at all. Yeah, I don't think it has. I think Leslie Kane was in it, uh, Nick Pope, and is Mark still there? Did yeah, he fall I'm asleep? No, I sent okay. him home. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, that's right. We're home. It's his yeah. home. Yeah, so that's right. He made me wait outside for a little while. Yeah. Were you in that show, Close Encounters? Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I do the uh, NASA's Unexplained Files series. Uh-huh. Well, you do more than that. You're in like several shows. Well, yeah, a few, but you know, I don't, I kind of yeah. put that out. Don't there. be so humble. He's uh, humble. <laughs> yes. yeah. We're in his bunker. You got to see this bunker. It's a, yeah, um, and actually, you can see this on YouTube. This will be on YouTube. Oh, but cool. uh, yeah, we're in his bunker. It looks just like we're in uh, a, a destroyer or something. Yeah, um, you know, World War Two. There's rivets everywhere, and, and uh, real portholes. Portholes, real portholes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really uh, quite unique, for sure. Wow, crazy! Well, if I have to work here, it has to look good, you know. <laughs> Does he have a flux capacitor? Um, no, I've I been looking for one, but I, I didn't go some... the sci-fi route. I had several people that asked me to make this a, a sci-fi themed thing, so he'd like walk into Star Trek or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, I do a lot of work for the Navy, as you know, and um, the Navy guys like to see naval stuff. So they yeah. show up. There's a diver's helmet, you know. There's a, you know, there's rivets in the walls. There's these, there's rust stains on sheetrock that look like yeah. steel, and it just looks really weird. Yeah, it's a little patchy like a real one is. But I know you do lots of space stuff, too, not only the consulting for NASA's uh, files or whatever that is, but also you build these uh, planets, right? Oh, that's correct. I, I have uh, about 175 buildings left to go in the United States. Wow. Um, a number of them right there in Arizona near you. We, we did uh, Gilbert, Arizona, and a bunch of others. and. Um, we make these giant planets that hang from the ceiling, and they're illuminated. So they're really cool looking. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Do you have any there? Uh, no, I just saw pictures. I, I don't. I showed I showed yeah. Martin some pictures uh, oh. earlier. I thought we maybe you would... second. We opened up a second <laughs> FX models out in Colorado. So oh, cool. Uh, I have another group in Arvada, Colorado. That's actually working with me on this project. Oh, yeah. I know where that is. Actually. I was just kind of. I was kind of thinking that you would give. Um, Martin, a planet as a gift, and I was just kind of picturing him driving yeah. home in his Yugo with a giant Mars. <laughs> in the, I was thinking in the of back Jupiter. Seat. I might as well go yeah. big. 
Jupiter yeah, and all the moons four feet in diameter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that'll, that'll just that'll just take up a lot of space. And after he gets I, pulled over a few times, he'll dump yeah. it. Yeah, it's like I don't know what Martin now. really drives. I don't know why I picture a Hugo when I think of him driving around, but <laughs> not quite. But anyway, hey, yeah. thanks a lot, Alejandro. All right, no problem. Thank uh, you. I appreciate you joining us live. Yep, no problem. You guys have fun. All right, and I'll Thank be talking you. to you next week. Okay, talk to you soon. All right, so this is the official welcome to Mark D'Antonio. Uh, you have FX Model. You're the chief video and image analyst for MUFON. Yes. Uh, you can tout about yourself a little bit. What's some some more things? You've been on the show a number of times. Yeah, I, well, I like doing your show in particular because you ask all the great questions, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I do I do work for the Navy on, on occasion, and um, we are making, as Alejandro was talking about, these giant planets for these facilities all around the country right now. And that's like a – turning out to be a six- or seven-year project. Wow. So it's a long project with a lot of work. Wow. So, now, um, just to let the listener know, if you're listening live, you can call in at 603-967-4030, or you can jump over to podcastufo.com and jump in the chat room and pose a question. Now, what I'd like to do this first hour of the show um, is talk about um, UFOTOG. Uh, we have a little object right here in front. We're going to talk about your your uh, prototype. Um, then I'd like to talk about UFOs in general and MUFON and all that stuff. And the second hour is going to be a little unconventional for what the podcast UFO listener is used to. I want to talk everything to do with astronomy, the cosmos, the Big Bang, dark matter. I want to really get into all that stuff. So if you don't like any of that stuff, you really don't have to listen to the second part of the show. Well, it is Dark Matter Radio, right? Yeah, it's Dark Matter Radio (laughs) Network, right? But anyway, so we're going to get into, uh, first of all, you were doing something very similar to what um, UFO, UFO data or, or data.com. Uh, very similar. You have a very similar plan. Um, you, um, for the YouTube, uh, this show is also on YouTube. People can listen to it. For the YouTube listener, um, this will be a video. So can you just lift that up, that unit right up? He has a prototype of this unit that has these. How many cameras are there on that? There's uh, eight cameras on this one, and uh, the cameras are, are extremely low-light cameras, and they're also very high resolution. They do 4K resolution each, wow. which is yeah a huge amount of resolution per camera. Yeah, and, and I see there's uh, two solar panels. Yeah, those those have already been changed because um, <laughs> they were just notionally put on there to illustrate where solar power would go or yep. come from. But as it turns out, we're going to move them to the column because this thing is going to be eight feet in the air. So on the column, the post that this thing is I sitting see. on, we're going to put a big flat panel. Oh, I got it. And this will be on an eight-foot pole. And about how many um, – well, let's see. It's been over a year since we talked. And I had you on with Doug Trumbull. Yep. You're doing this together. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, is there anything more you can talk about what has happened since that last we last spoke? Since we last spoke, uh, we've actually – uh, designed the camera. There is one in existence. And um, the camera, as I said, very high resolution, extremely low light. And um, we're, we have it already set up, so we're ready to put it to a circuit board. And uh, we're just hunting down lenses that we're going to use because uh, this camera also goes into the infrared. So that's a boon, mm-hmm. okay, a benefit. Yep. Um, and to do that, we are going to need to use lenses that are not glass. Uh, so we're investigating different glass or different non-glass solutions to our lenses uh-huh. that allow in more energy so we can see this light energy better. Um, let's see. There's a question up here. Um, have you had a chance to see and evaluate the UFO over Houston photo? I've seen so many UFOs over Houston. I'm not sure which one they're talking uh, this about. This is a recent one. I think that Alejandro just um, – Spoke of. I'll ask the um, guy in the chat room. This is a chat room question. Oh, okay. Um, but while um, um, you should put, let's see. While we're while I pose the question, I'm going to ask you a question first. Sure. Um, I talked about um, you're one of my favorite guests. I've always enjoyed having you on the show. Well, thanks. And um, 
And you you were very, very sick. I remember sending you an email, I think in May or something like that. You never responded, which was totally unlike you. And yeah. you were clinging clinging on for life. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're so so glad you made it and you seemed in really good health. Uh, you're okay now. I'm back. You're back. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm back from almost not being back. That's right. Um, it was real close. Yeah, I had an infection in my heart valves. And they actually had to change my heart valves on Memorial Day. And you haven't lived until you see a hospital where there's just a skeleton staff and you're supposed to go into a major surgery. And you're in a dark room in the pre-op prep area, which is normally hustling and bustling. And it's a dark room and you're the only bed. And Mm -hmm. you're the only one there. And the surgeon comes over to you and says, we're almost ready for you. And that's the last thing I remember. And then I didn't wake up until... Five, eight days later because they had to put me into a coma because uh, there was an unexpected turn of events during the surgery. And they had there were clots in the heart that got loose and went to my brain, causing five separate strokes. And they said that any one of those strokes could have done me in. <clears throat> so why I'm here, I have no idea. But I did wake up in June as a quadriplegic. I couldn't move. You couldn't move? And nope. people... The, the nurses put um, something in your eyes to keep them moist. So they didn't oh. even know you were conscious. Yeah, you know what? That's right. You know, when, when, you're, when they put you into an induced coma uh, and you're out for any period of time, they put this gel on your eyes to help keep them from drying out. Well, they put that in my eyes. And when I was in the induced coma, I wasn't in a coma at all. I was actually awake. Ugh. And I could hear them talking about me. I could hear them saying to my family, well, he's probably going to be a quadriplegic and blind. You heard them say that. I heard them say that. And there I am lying there in this bed thinking, wait, I'm still here. I, I can I can function. I can I can hear everything you're saying to me. You know? That is... And I thought the blindness was the gel in my eyes. This is what it means to be blind. Then a nurse came in and wiped the gel out to change it. And I I could see, you know, my eyes were really messed up. I woke up with compound eye fly vision. Where it's oh, no. all... You see like a million oh, things? A million different things and little tiny pockets of, oh, I would never wish that upon anyone. But boy, wow. I, that, that's why flies always hit the window. Boom, 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 boom. You know, because they've got this vision all over the place, I guess. But anyway, it was... Uh, that all alleviated. It all went away. And... Uh, <clears throat> I think it's I think it's like every person's nightmare to be stuck in a place like that where no one knows... That's your, oh, my God. I'm, I'm so glad you're back and you You have it. no idea what it's like to wake up in a body that doesn't work. Oh, I you can't know? even imagine. And you can't, it's giving you me goosebumps oh, talking about it. You can't even it. scratch your itch. Jeez. You can't do anything. And and you oh. don't know whether it's going to change. But it did. Yeah, the part where you didn't know whether it was going to change. <clears throat> yep. Oh, my God. Yep. Okay. There was, a, a, there was a, a question here on the message board. Are you aware of uh, Christopher O'Brien? He has a similar strategy to collect UFO data in the San Luis Valley. I know Valley. Chris. In fact, we've talked a, a, a couple times on his project. And when we uh, get our cameras ready, Chris and I are going to talk. Because I, I would love to collaborate with what he's doing anyway. Because uh, he has some unique and novel approaches to this subject. That's great. That's great. So, um as far as I just have to say, yes. The thing is, you know, there's UFO data, there's UFOTOG. We've been doing ours for two or three years. UFO, you know, UFO data shows up. You know, they're, they're doing theirs. <clears throat> Chris O'Brien's doing his. This data and the results belong to humanity. It doesn't belong to any one of us. I love to hear you say that. Oh no, it does. You know, yeah. Doug Trumbull and I are working on UFOTOG two with our science team and scientists from Lawrence Livermore Labs that are geniuses as far as we're concerned. And, you know, we have no monopoly on this data. We are going to share this data. We are going to make it available. And when Doug and I were on, we did mention that too as well, that this is humanity's data. I love hearing this. Now, did you – you have not heard from Leslie Kane or Mark Rodinger or anyone. Um, I've tried to connect you two, but nothing's nothing's happening. Yeah, no, I I didn't hear from them, uh, but – Interestingly, I was up at Doug's studio. We were working on a project. And up the driveway comes this little car, and out gets Leslie Kane. You know, and she comes up to say, Doug, I got a little thing to show you. And we, we did something for her right there. You know, on this the was a while ago? This or? was a while ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On the spur of the moment. It had nothing to do with UFO data or anything like that. Yeah. Um, or UFO tag, for that matter. So <clears throat> it was kind of interesting because Doug and Leslie are friends. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. 
Well, I'd like to see some type of collaboration. I mean, it only makes sense. I yeah, mean, there's, there's, there's no competitors as far as we're yeah. concerned. There's only collaborators, people that will collaborate with us. Yeah. I and hope everyone choose, feels that way. Maybe that's the issue. Yeah, if they choose not to, that's you know, their thing. We're hoping to punch through that. Yeah. You know, for the greater good, for humanity's, uh, you know, answers. Right. To whether, right. you know, we're being visited or not. Right. Now, is this, the, these are up on polls. Um, how are they going to be monitored? Well, let me first explain what they've got because that will tell you. Each one of these units uh, is going to have a... Uh, gamma ray detector, EMF detector, magnetic anomaly detector. This is important stuff because now if the camera sees nothing, we might see a gamma ray pop in or we may see a magnetic change or a local gravity change in the area. Now, that's still cause for an alert, even mm -hmm. if the camera doesn't see anything visually mm. or in the infrared or the ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we also have a GPS transmitter on board. This thing is going to send an alert to my smartphone in my pocket and the smartphone of everyone on its list. The instant it sees something that it can rule out as a satellite, a plane, or a coyote trying to pee on our unit if it was on the ground. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so, so for all, how many units do you plan to have out there? Oh, that's going to depend on our, our funding. We're, we're talking to people right now. When I was in Los Angeles, we, we met with people that uh, were interested in being part of this with us, have you? Um, have, are you funded yet? This is you're not funded yet, but you're, it looks like you may be. Uh, I so. can't say we're funded yet. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, our our mission has remained un, remained unchanged. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug originated Ufotog using a Humvee with a big giant right. theodolite, three four hundred pounds would come out of the Humvee's roof and very dramatically sweep the sky and you know turn this four hundred pound system of telescopes and sensors around in less than a second uh -huh. okay so you didn't want to be in its way it would knock you right out <laughs> now so, do you, is that machine still oh that machine's still in existence absolutely yeah. and and is doug on this coast or is he on the west coast well he grew up in in hollywood okay los angeles but actually he moved here over 30 years ago 35 years ago so he's only less than an hour from me and we hooked huh. up five years ago to do movies and special effects and hunt UFOs together. Yeah, I I was talking to an entertainment lawyer the other day on a on a ferry on Long, on Long Island, and um, he basically said the only two places you can be in the United States is either New York or California to do entertainment. Um, speaking of that, I just want to tell a quick reaction. Um, I we got a, I got in a conversation with this this guy who was a lot of fun and everything. And I said something about my podcast, and he goes, oh, what type of podcast do you do? And I said, well, it's a little esoterical. It's on UFOs. And this was his, his phrase to me is what I thought was very interesting. He goes, I really shouldn't tell you this, mm -hmm. but I had an incredible UFO sighting. Um, he described it. It was up. Uh, but I just thought that phrase alone, I really shouldn't tell you this. You know, he's thinking because he's a lawyer or what? I don't know what he was thinking. Well, maybe he was just self-censoring, you know. Because yeah, I really shouldn't true. tell you this because then you might think I'm a nut if you want to finish the <laughs> sentence, right? Yeah. Because that's what I get, too. I get a lot of that. Well, he actually – this is an interesting UFO sighting, and I always like to hear interesting ones. They saw it. It was um, over uh, – out of Long Island. They were in a pool. His siblings and him were in a pool, and this thing was out over the ocean, over the, the – I don't know if the bay or the, the sound or what. But it shot down a very bright beam of light into the water. And a bunch of other people saw it. There was people around, not just them. Yep. And then when the beam retracted, the thing shot off. And when it did, there was like a mist coming up where the beam of light was. So I asked him, I said, was the beam of light a strange color? Did it look, you know, that's a lot of times you hear about the beam of light is unusual. And he said, no, it just looked like a really bright beam of light shot right down. No. And um, then he said his sister posted something on Facebook and the posting erased. And so he goes, is there a possible government cover-up? <laughs> I said, I don't know. That's but. the place everybody loves to go. But yes, uh, yeah. let me tell you how a logical investigator would approach that particular case. Just real quick. Yeah. You see a beam of light aiming down into the ocean. The first thing you're going to do is listen for a sound. You may not hear Oh, yes, it. no sound. Right, yeah. of course. Uh -huh. There's never sound. Yeah. Well, that's because it might have been far away. Mm -hmm. However, uh, and, and sound over the water doesn't always carry. You may not hear it ever. Depends so, on the wind. Right. Yeah. Now, that beam of light 
originated with something. You say, okay, let's assume it's some vehicle. What might it be that we make? Well, it's not an airplane because it looks stationary, you say. Um, how about a helicopter? Okay, let's work with that. Let's start with helicopter. Let's try to explain it as a helicopter with a searchlight beam. Now, if it was a searchlight beam aiming straight down, okay, it would probably be relatively close to the water. All right, maybe 100, 200 feet up above the water, whatever. Now, if it was, when it was doing its thing, what else is it doing? The wind is hitting the water Mm -hmm. and driving up a mist. Mm -hmm. So when they shut the lights off, now you see a mist. And you might not even see the helicopter. So that's a possibility. It is a possibility. It doesn't mean that's what it was. Yeah. It just means that you have to look at the logical explanations first. Rule them out one by one. Right. I agree. And then what you're left with is the unknown. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Don't jump right to aliens. Right. As they say. Now, um, if you're listening live, please do jump. We have a low turnout so far in the chat room, which is unusual. I'm not sure what's going on. There's only 15 of you in there, and we know there's a lot of you listening. So if you want to jump in, podcastufo.com, and uh, put your comments up there or ask some questions. And uh, going back to UFO talk on these units, um, someone posted up there, why don't you use uh, like a Kickstarter or UFUNDME? Uh, and also someone wanted to know about what the cost per unit. Have you figured that out yet? Well, the, the ideal cost per unit would be um, – Two or three thousand dollars, but uh, most likely the first unit is going to cost a lot more than that. Then we're mm-hmm. going to work on miniaturization and getting all the other uh, ducks in a row, so to speak, in order to get these things cheaper. Yeah, now that means making our own circuit boards and doing that kind of thing, which we can do. Yeah, that's not a problem. So, uh, would you farm that out or would you actually do the work yourself? Well, we would actually have someone make the circuit boards for us, yeah, but we let them go into their own little, you know bidding wars as to who can do it better, easier, and then we'll test one of their circuits, and if it works, we'll mass produce it. Um, that's something Doug would be involved in because he has a lot of connections in the camera industry. Uh, <clears throat> and we have a lot of technology partners that are working with us, um, but none of them have the equipment we need, so we have to build it. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that's unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. Now, is everything weatherproof, really, like for any type of weather? Well... Nothing is is weatherproof, okay? Uh, Resistant. With with acid rain and pollutants, uh, you really care about where you put these things. Mm -hmm. If you put them on a post in San Diego, you are going to get a healthy amount of baking from any sunlight as well as acid rain during the wet months, uh, during the June gloom, so to speak. So we have to be careful, but... That really applies to our lens systems on the camera. And initially, for phase one, we're going to involve MUFON with our projects so that they, with their boots on the ground, field investigators and state directors, we're going to have them go out into the field and work on doing maintenance for us on these units. Now, I I know I think I asked you how many units do you plan. You said that depends on funding. Just a rough idea, of, and, and where would they be stationed? Well, let's say what we need, okay, yep. not, not in terms of money, but just in terms of units. We see these things being a mile apart, set up in a triad, a triangle, okay? Mm-hmm. At a mile apart, if unit A sees something in the sky, the first thing it's going to do is confer with unit B and say, do you see it too, basically? Mm-hmm. If unit B sees it, then we can triangulate the altitude, the speed, everything about it, and calculate its its orbit, basically, and figure out, is that a satellite? Or is it something much nearer to the Earth? And so that kind of thing is going to be built into the system. We won't even get an alert if it's a satellite that it catches, because it'll know it. Mm-hmm. But that's dependent on two things. Triangulation, to be able to get its altitude, And also, from a single platter, we call these platters, in a single platter case, where it looks looks up into the sky, sees something, it can still consult the database and say, am I supposed to be seeing something right at that point in the sky? And if so, we will still alert on it. Oh, you mean like something like the space station flying over or something like that? That's right. Yeah. A satellite. Uh Uh-huh. And that's that's important because we have to get... uh, 
all the data we can from these units that's usable. And we don't want the data that's not. In other words, if you see a light coming toward this thing, but you also get a transponder squawk coming from that thing, we know it's an aircraft. We don't even alert on that. Of course, if the, if the aircraft does a 90-degree turn and goes wildly up into space, we'd want to know that. And that's the kind of thing that uh, you know, we have to work into the software. Uh, Shane from uh, Australia says, this is serious stuff the UFO field needs, and I, I agree. Uh, thank you, Shane. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And um, how many other people are on board besides you and Doug? Are there on, You said scientists are interested? Yeah, I, I have a number of scientists that are on board with us um, that are actively building components, people in Las Vegas, people in Arizona, um, people in California. And so we have a number of people that are working with us on this. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, currently, Doug and I and one other our chief scientist, uh, we, we're making all the choices as to what kind of units we want and that kind of thing so far. We haven't actually involved other people to get a, uh, a uniform agreement on everything we want to do yet because mm-hmm. uh, we know what we want to do and we know that what we'll do will suffice. But Chris O'Brien, for instance, he has some great ideas. Mm-hmm. He might change our direction with a sentence, yep. you know, but it won't change us entirely. We have a plan. You can see our unit right in front of us here spinning on a little turntable. Uh-huh. Okay. This thing is fairly far along in our development plan. And so we we understand its power requirements, the consumption requirements, the camera requirements, the requirements for making a GPS connection because we're actually doing GPS bounce when we send signals up to a satellite. We're sending them to a GPS satellite. Wow. And we're bouncing our messages off a GPS satellite and then down to our smartphones so we can get an alert wherever we are. Phase one will mean that if anyone wants to see the data, they're going to have to go out to the unit and take it off the unit. In phase two, we're going to log into the unit and download it from an FTP server. This, to me, just everything you're describing seems much more involved than the two or $3,000 you're talking about. It just sounds... I know it sounds like it's expensive, but you have to understand that we're building the camera. Okay, we're designing it. It's, just, it's just like it's like how much do we want to sell them for? That's our call. You know, how much is the chip going to cost? The materials? That's much less than the actual cost of the thing you buy. So again, this is humanity's data. We can't give them away, but we're going to try and put as much, pack as much into them as possible. Now. The writing of the software, that's a volunteer effort. People mm-hmm. are volunteering to write the software. so Yeah, the software sounds a little tricky. Yeah, well, it is and it isn't. There, there's people out there already. I met several at the uh, MUFON Symposium in Los Angeles uh, just, what, September. And they are doing some very cool things with tracking software that they wrote. Um, and I'm very interested in talking to them some more and finding out uh, more about what they're doing. But the fact is, as I said, we want to make this thing low cost so that anyone can get a hold of them if they want to. When you mean anyone, do you mean um, people that want to do research themselves? Absolutely. Okay. And the only caveat is that once it goes online and starts recording data, we can't be excluded from that loop. I see. We are in that loop. So I have a a mountaintop in Maine. (laughs) If I wanted to put this on the mountaintop on a platform I have yep. that's way up in the air that you can see a yep. uh, big open sky, yep. uh, I could talk to you about that. Are you uh, asking, are you yeah, asking yeah. for a unit? <laughs> Come on now, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that, that um, the I mean, part, that, that is attractive. I'm not asking for a discount. No, I know, yeah. but that is an attractive prospect. Uh-huh. I know that we're going to be doing testing in, in Arizona. With the yeah. units. Uh, now, what about hot, someone just put up on the message board? What about um, hot spots? Well, that's the whole idea of having these ready to ship. Mm-hmm. Okay, we ha- we want to have a bunch of these in reserve so that we can send several triads. That is three units and several of them because each is going to be spaced in a mile triangle. Right, yeah. and that gives us the maximum coverage for doing a, uh, a triangulation and maximizes the likelihood of being able to triangulate an object in the sky. And we want to have several of these out 
uh, available, ready to go. So if someone says, well, we're getting a whole bunch of, of UFOs in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Where? Right here in, 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 you know, uh, in the Twin Cities, okay, or, or uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Okay, well, we're going to send you two triads. And we'll instruct you how to you know, set them up and how to connect them. And once you install it, you push a little button and wait for all the lights to turn green. And now they're ready. You can walk away. Wow. We'll make it that simple. Wow, nice. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you know who Chase Kletzky is. Of course I know Chase. Oh, okay. So Chase was telling me down in Tennessee there's, like, this um, guy who's a race car driver. He doesn't She doesn't want to say who he is. But um, there's a triangle going over his cornfields quite often. And is that something like if you know of a situation like that, is that something that you will initiate putting one of these these th- three of these units out in a spot like that, or is it all without question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, without question. See, if someone claims that, okay, the first thing we want to do is test the claim, reproduce the data. Mm-hmm. Our scientific units don't get fooled by depth perception. They don't get fooled by personality quirks that might make you, you know, uh, think you see aliens where you don't, okay? Mm -hmm. They're not fooled by anything related to human nature. They're by rote devices to capture data, multiple sources of data at the same time per sighting. Mm. So if someone says, I saw a bright light, and then it winked out, and then I saw this blue flash, okay? If it's not on our data, then... I can't say whether you saw that or not. I can just say the data didn't support your assertion. Now, last time I did a show with uh, Leslie, uh, had Leslie Kane and uh, Mark Rodiger on, and we were talking about this in the units. Uh, Ray Stanford was listening. He's probably listening right now. He listens to most of the shows. Yep. Thank you, Ray, if you're listening. Um, he uh, wrote me right away and said, what about what I was doing the same thing back in the 19, early 1970s. Um, he had two million dollars worth of equipment back then, which was huge. This was out in the desert, mm-hmm. um, and he still has, you know, some of this equipment. Now Ray is is uh, um, he's in his seventies. I hope you don't mind me saying that, Ray. Um, and, and but he still wants to get active. He, he has still some wants cool to dinosaur tracks. Does he ever? <laughs> yeah. Um, but Ray r- really wants to get involved. Now, someone like Ray, can how would you involve someone like him that really has a passion for this, that really wants the information, and also has a background where he has used this type of equipment before? See, I would, I would, uh, I'd have Ray contact us, and I would, you know, put him in touch with uh, uh, Doug, and we would have a conference call together and discuss the potential input from Ray, mm-hmm. and see if he can help us. Yeah. You know, if he wants to be involved, um, you know. If this was a community effort and it was a crowd-funded effort, then it would be a little bit different than the way it is now. Uh, we chose not to go the crowd-funded route. In fact, Doug and I talked about crowdfunding two years ago for this. But we, we chose not to do it because um, there were several high-end people that Doug wanted to talk to beforehand. For yeah. investing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it's much better dealing with one person. Yes. Than having to deal with three hundred or and four thousand, and there 000. can be control issues as well. Yeah, you know, and I personally believe that if you're going to contribute to a crowdfunded effort, you should have some say in what happens to that effort. Yeah, we have we have a, a couple of things for the sake of accuracy and truthfulness. Ask him how to explain the satellite bounce thing. Oh, uh, you mean what we're doing? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it's actually. Uh, just a GPS relay, and uh, anyone can do it. In fact, uh, around the world, sailors use these systems all the time to send GPS messages out to show people where they are at any point in their track. And we're going to take the base unit that does that, and we're going to add our own custom messaging to it. I mean, that's exactly what we're doing. There's no no mystery there, nothing hidden, nothing to hide. Okay. Um, and... Hang on just one minute. There was another question here, and it's – all right. Basically, they just wanted to know about how it bounced off the satellite. And so – oh, yes, someone wanted to know if this – if there was any type of radar. 
that radar is pretty intense. You yeah. can't really put it on a small unit. Yeah, right? no, radar, we, 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 we thought about radar. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we actually thought about sonar for detecting low-level intrusion to the, to the sites. Mm-hmm. The trouble is that that takes up energy. You know, and we're going to have a battery being charged by a solar panel during the day, and it has to make it through the night. So this, uh, if you have sonar, it's going to be beeping constantly unless it can be activated. Correct. It could be motion. There could be a motion detector, mm-hmm. okay, and then you could map out the trajectory of something then using sonar. The trouble is it would get set off all the time, maybe by bats or, or large insects. Right. We yeah. don't want any of that. Yeah. You know, because anything close to the unit... Uh, is, is nothing we're going to really be interested in unless it's a gigantic hovering silver disc <laughs> with gray aliens with big black almond-shaped eyes saying, What's that, Frank? I don't know. All right, well, I, I'm just, I, I thought we could change gears and uh, talk about... Um, now, when you were out of commission, when did you get back into commission where you could actually do some MUFON work? Uh, when, I was in, see, when, I, uh, was, when I was in rehab... I was relearning how to walk. And I was relearning how to talk. My uh, my voice was like this. I couldn't talk. So I had you know to reshape the words again. I had to relearn. Uh, so in July, uh, I came home uh, this past July after having no movement in early June. By July 2nd, I was walking with a walker and I came home. And... Uh, I threw away the walker a week later uh, and started making my way precariously across the room to the wall that seemed like a thousand miles away. Hmm. And when I got there, I held on like, yes, I made it, and I didn't fall. And to this date, I haven't fallen once, which is great. But that took, from the time it all happened to the time I got back into commission fully for MUFON, um, I set a goal that by September I would attend the MUFON Symposium and do my uh, main speaker talk. I was surprised when you were going to do that. I surprised myself because I wasn't <laughs> sure I could do it because I yeah. couldn't talk very well. Huh. I couldn't say the word words. It was coming out woods, mm-hmm. you know. So I sat there all day long going words, words, and I retaught my mouth how to shape out the words. Wow. And then any any word that was giving me trouble, I did that. Uh-huh. Um, so then uh, I went out to the symposium, and I, I taught... For one day, I taught the field investigator training. Then the next day, I did my main speaker talk. And it went very well. Better than I thought it would for me, you know, health-wise. But my voice was giving out because Mm -hmm. I have a paralyzed vocal cord even now. And I had to have vocal cord surgery a few weeks ago to fix that. Are you good for the show? (laughs) Am I going to have to finish the show? (laughs) I am indeed. I have a lower vocal register than I've ever had. (laughs) So it sounds better, but... Uh, but actually, when did you... And I have one... I want to jump... We're going to have to jump back. Oh, also, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so in September is really when I started back into MUFON, but I was okay. doing investigations and other things, you know, uh, like a month prior to that. And in August, I was doing stuff. Yeah. But uh, my eyes were still not... I wasn't able to see properly yet yeah. by That's August. That's pretty important. Yeah. And so yeah. by September... It had leveled out to the point where I can now read and I can do my texts on the phone and messages. And I can I'm, I'm, actually, before you arrived, I put the finishing touches on the last chapter of my book. So yeah. that's, you know, I actually wrote. And your, and your book chapters. is uh, When's It Do Out? And what's the name? The and name is The Populated Universe. And it discusses exoplanet technology, how we find planets around other stars, what it means to us, and whether that means. Uh, that alien beings exist and could have found us. Oh, good. Because we're going to be talking technology. about that in the second hour. I know we are. And that's <laughs> yeah. going to be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Phil had asked a question. I don't want to um, – uh, Phil's been a great supporter of the show all the way from way back. Um, and he asked, going back to the UFO talk transmitter, um, does it have a directional antenna on it too? Uh, at, at the most, it has a it, no. It's omni. It, it listens in all directions. It sees in all directions at the same time. It has separate cameras that are high resolution, so they take out a small patch of sky that allow you to get you know zoom in with with some resolution, so that you don't have to worry about um, you know fuzziness and pixelation. 
the antenna that's on there that's omnidirectional, the, really the one antenna, is the cell phone antenna because it's actually got a track phone built into it. Huh. Yeah, that way we can call it and ask it to tell us if it's okay. Huh. How yeah, about it's that? a self-diagnostic thing. How about and that's that? actually not hard to do. That, 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 those kinds of programs already exist mm-hmm. for using a cell phone to connect to something and just do a diagnosis. I see. Anyone can call on the show if you're listening live at 603-967-4030. Now, um, and we will be talking, someone asked uh, about the exoplanets, and we'll be talking about that in hour two coming right up fairly soon, only in about 10 minutes. Uh, We're going to start talking about all that type of thing. Now, since you've been back, um, who was taking care of the photo analysis and video analysis work while you were gone, while you were out? Um, the in Southern California, there's a woman named Cindy Costello, and uh, she has been uh, working with me on photo analysis for a long time. And I asked Jan Harzan uh, at headquarters to include her. Uh, we also have another photo analyst, Sam Falvo, who is a part of our team. And the idea is that we want to make a, a video and you know photo analysis unit. Mm-hmm. Okay, we want to create enough people so that if a problem occurs, like it happened to me, we don't lose the the full expertise of a photo analysis unit. I have to say though, to be a photo analyst doesn't mean you know how to use cameras. It doesn't mean you just know astronomy. You have to know how human nature works to understand psychology of what people see when they look in the sky. You have to understand how the human body works so you can understand why our eyes are separated by a few inches and what that means for depth perception, especially at night against a black sky. It was as big as a football field. It mm-hmm. was a mile up. Mm-hmm. That's useless information, in fact. Yeah. Because there's no way to prove it or show it because the human being is not capable at all of making those determinations. I hate to say it, but it's absolutely true. Um, you know, some people say uh, Mark D'Antonio, he's a debunker of – I've heard that said before. Alejandro and, said that. <laughs> and and I don't – what I, I, I think you – what I think and you know, how I take you is taking – you're taking a scientific look and a logical look. And everything you just said just now to me makes total sense. Like when I saw the object that I saw, I guessed it was 300 feet or so in the air. It could be 1,000 feet. I don't know. You know, the reason I don't know is because it was kind of up and over and there was nothing to judge by. It was near nothing that I could judge the size of it and how far up it was. It could have been a large object farther away or a small object much closer. And that's – we run into that all the time. Yeah. You also have to understand, for instance, earth science in order to do this because you have to understand geological processes that can generate lights on the earth and cause, you know, atmospheric phenomena. It, it really becomes complicated. You know, it's not just understanding cameras. And, oh, yes, by the way, you have to understand cameras intimately and yes. how they work. Uh-huh. Now, there's uh, there was a article that Open Minds had up, and I talked uh, with Alejandro on his show, I believe. And it looked um, like a triangle, but you could tell it was not a lens flare. It was inside the lens itself. What do you call that? Well, I mean, a lens flare is something that occurs inside the lens. Okay, it was, so uh, they called it something else, like a... Internal lens reflection, maybe? Yeah, reflection. That's what yeah. it was, internal reflection. Yeah, that's... See, the, what happens is a lens is built in a very purposeful way to take as much light in as it can get and not let stray light that may bounce around on the inside from impeding the view or impeding what the, the quality of what it captures. Now, each lens has these little round black rings in them. They're called baffles. And they're they're designed mathematically to prevent the stray light from bouncing farther than just one wall bounce off of a lens inside. If it does bounce more than once, it's very likely that you're going to see it on the finished picture. Now, what about also there's um, there's UFOs on Google, Google, <laughs> Google Maps, Google Earth, all that. And those are all you know, the pink UFOs, as they call them, I'm sure Oh, I had that. that case. I did that case. And, and um, that kind of went away as soon as we showed the same pink UFO was superimposed on someone's lawn, okay, below the, the Not car. a flamingo. 
Yeah, it wasn't. It was actually just yeah. the lens flare from the system they used. Yeah. You're actually seeing a pink color of the lens coatings mm. uh, being transmitted through the lens flare. Sure, sure. Um, have you – we've we've got um, like six or eight minutes or so left. Have you – since you've been back in action for MUFON, uh, what would you say some – can you talk about some notable cases that you've investigated? Well – uh, actually, well, there's a historical case where, uh, it, again, it's from the, the 70s, I believe. And this, I know this is, is historical, but I like this. The car that was involved in this was actually in, you know, is in the museum. Oh, yes. I just uh, just pulled that you know up on one. a blogger. It looks like a Grand Torino. 1979, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. And the this UFO object actually put a hole in this guy's windshield. Val, Val... Uh, I'm trying to remember the officer's name. Yes, exactly, and 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 he was a, he was a Val Johnson officer of the law. Yeah, that's right. And I actually thought that was really cool. And, and and it doesn't have anything to do with being back at Mufon now, but it's a case that I just had never heard about. I mean, go figure. I've been in Mufon since nineteen nineteen seventy one, and wow. it started in nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. So I was eleven when I joined this group. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Yeah, amazing. So that uh, that case um, is Val. Does Val ever talk about this? Uh, I saw an interview with him actually mm-hmm. uh, at one point. I don't remember, but I saw the car itself—a photo of the car with the hole in the windshield—and I was like, "Wow!" Yeah, you know what we could do now with that car, because we could go after that car with you know special devices to detect radiation and magnetism that might have changed the structure of the metal. Why doesn't anyone do that? Well, we didn't know about this. I didn't know about this. Oh, so this may happen. Well, I don't know. I, I'd like to see it happen. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to talk to our MUFON head of uh, technology. Now, when someone has uh, something like this comes up, does MUFON have the funding to actually involve, like, scientific research and something like this? Well, actually, we do have a star team uh, and a team of people that is on standby to go out to a real hot spot. Mm-hmm. And... Um, there have been a couple of cases like that, but uh, none to date that I remember you know, in recent time. But uh, I think that the problem is that, you know, MUFON's a volunteer organization. If they say to you, okay, Martin, you've got to get on a plane right now. Oh, I can't. i got to do a radio show. I can't just walk out. You know, we're, we have a lot of that going on, you know, where people are volunteering their time graciously and wonderfully. But it is volunteer time, and you can't lose sight of the fact that these are volunteers. Yeah. As, as, does that situation happen where someone says on MUFON, can you get on a plane and go, like now, type of thing? Well, that was the idea between, behind our star team, which is a rapid response team. Uh uh-huh. Yeah. And, and there was only a few people in, in MUFON originally that were members of that team because they were the most flexible and available and most knowledgeable. Okay. Right. I see. Other people were then made star team members, and... Uh, that's going through some changes, uh, and and so there still uh, is meant to be a rapid response of sorts. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and I'm not even sure if I'm on that list. I, I probably am, you know, for 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 what I can do. But it doesn't matter because I can do what I do here in my office. Mm-hmm. In this very cool office. Oh, I love <laughs> this office. I know I've described it before, but. I really do feel like I'm in a ship. I'm waiting for it to rock a back and forth a little bit. Well, that's that's why the floor is uneven. When you walk on the floor, you kind of feel uneven, and that's what made me decide it was going to be a ship is because I couldn't get the concrete level. <laughs> oh, so that – No lie. That was it. Really? No lie. Wow. How about that? Um, so ha- how about any videos that are – Contemporary videos that have come up. Anything um, interesting lately well, that you've looked at? Yeah, as Alejandro said, you know, we saw all the rocket launches yeah. on the West Coast. And, you know, the thing is, people have to understand, here on the East Coast, okay, where we are, when a rocket takes off, it goes out over the ocean. But on the West Coast, it goes out over the land. The rockets head up, head up and go east hmm. because they're using the rotation of the Earth to help them out. Ah. You know? Okay. So mm-hmm. they're already going 1,000-plus miles an hour on the launch pad. Hmm. So as soon as they take off and they're free of the Earth, they're going 1,000 miles an hour. Now they only have to accelerate to 17,000 miles an hour to make orbit, mm-hmm. 17,000 more miles an hour to get to orbit. 
they don't have to do that extra thousand that saves fuel. And believe it or not, that is a measurable you know, quantity that makes good financial sense. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. on the West Coast, if a rocket takes off from, say, Vandenberg, it's going to head out eastward, and people are going to see it. And if they take off after sunset or just before dawn, the sun illuminates the, the plume of the rocket mm-hmm. well up into the uh, upper atmosphere. So there's no real good time to make a secret rocket launch. A cloudy day. Actually, <laughs> uh, you could you could make a secret rocket launch at noon, you know, because then you know if you look at the sun, it's going to blind. It's going to be oh. blinding, you know. Yeah. But uh, it all depends on launch windows. Those those rockets are launched in such a way that they will achieve orbit at a particular time, particular place. They know every single uh, uh, right to the last uh, meter position. Uh, that these rockets will be in when they enter orbit. It's amazing how this works. Okay. Um, uh, Matthew, you've asked a couple of times on the, in the chat room, and he, uh, uh, Mark has not had a chance to look at that, Houston. But I'll tell you what, during the break, I know you sent a link. Please send another link, and I'm going to uh, show him the link real quick while we're on this music break coming up. And we'll talk about that. Briefly in hour two, and hour two is going to be reserved for all types of questions I have about astronomy and the cosmos. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So hang in there, everyone. And uh, Matthew, go ahead and post that if you would. I'll be happy to look at it, Matthew. So that's it for the first part of the show. If you want to listen to the whole show, and the second part is really good, I think, anyway, um, all you have to do is support us for a dollar or more a month right on podcastufo.com. And if you can't do that, we thank you for listening to this part of the show, and we appreciate each and every listener. Next week will be Cheryl Costa. And that's it for this evening. I want to thank everyone for helping out. First of all, the guests, Mark D'Antonio, Keith Rowland for helping out with the live portion of the show, Peggy Shunning for managing the Facebook page. Remember to like us on Facebook for all the latest UFO news, and Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for the music Well, that's it, and we'll see you next week. You can always listen live for the full show for free on the Dark Matter Digital Network at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's it, and we'll see you next week.